वंदना मैडम एम आई ऑडिबल यस यू आर ऑडिबल डॉक्टर डॉन बट हाउ कम मूर्ति इज अनएबल टू हियर मी नॉट एबल टू हियर यू बट या या आई विल जस्ट चेक वंस अगेन हां मूर्ति कैन यू हियर मी मूर्ति कैन यू हियर एस डॉक्टर मूर्ति यू आर ऑल्सो नॉट ऑडिबल से समथिंग मे बी यू आर ऑन म्यूट Murti can you hear us shall we start the session Murti
not able to hear you, Raman. I don't know if you're talking to me. Um, absolutely, I'm not able to hear you. I'm unmuted, I'm talking. Um, don't know if you can hear me. Um, but I, I, you are not audible at all to me. Can some participants confirm that, uh, you know, they're able to hear me? Am I coming out clear? Murti, can you hear me? Murti, try logging out and logging in. I think again he is on mute. Uh, uh, but you are audible. Am I audible to you? You are very much audible. No problem. What's wrong with Murti? And we could hear him also in between, you know, very clearly. Yeah, yeah. Beginning when the session started, he was quite clear. Now also, uh, mm -hmm. just two minutes back, probably we could hear him. But I don't know where were you. He asked you something. No, I was trying to connect him over the phone. Yeah, so we gave him thumbs up, but maybe he's not seen. We'll wait anyways. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now, Murti? Oh, yeah, now, yes. Oh, yes, wow. yes. Please. Yeah, please. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I think we're all set. Dr. Raman is introducing, I suppose. Oh, Dr. Vandana, how are you? Good, good. How are you doing? Good, good. I looked at your presentation. It was wonderful. It is uh, it's like a dictionary for anybody oh. who'd want to apply for a <laughs> grant proposal. I printed a copy and kept on my table. Oh, thank you so much. In fact, that was so that, you know, youngsters... Uh, have everything on table and they don't have any excuse to give to write. That, that's what I'm going to deal with now. Today's presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So basically, yeah. you know, everything is available now. Uh, government is also very open. So, mm -hmm. so is industry. So I think we should all take benefit of this. And Perfect. Shall we, with your permission, shall we start, Murti? Oh, yeah. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll just introduce and then you can take over. Okay. So my, uh, my dear friends, today we have uh, Dr. S. Narsima Murthy, my close friend, 
who is the resource person and he's going to talk on how did I get my research grants. He's a professor of pharmaceutics and drug delivery and associate professor of Center for Pharmaceutical Technology at the University of Mississippi School of Pharmacy. Dr. Murthy is also the founder director of Philanthropic Nonprofit Research Organization Institute for Drug Delivery and Biomedical Research in Bangalore, India. In the US, Dr. Murthy's research progresses and programs are funded by NIH, US FDA, and pharmaceutical industries. At IDBR Bangalore, Dr. Murthy's team has scored over eight major research grants since 2013 from BIREC, BRNS, and pharmaceutical companies. He has published over 120 research papers and presented over 200 scientific posters in various national and international scientific meetings. He has authored two books and 15 book chapters. Dr. Murthy has received several awards such as New Investigator Award and many others. He is a top scientist since long and is very humble. He's a person beyond compare. He's a researcher to the core. He's a close friend of all of us in India and a true man of the profession. Dr. Murthy, over to you. Thank you, Raman. Um, thank you, Shukumar. I, I would like to thank KPTI at the outset for giving me this opportunity to share my experience. Uh, basically, this is not a scientific presentation. Of course, it is about science, but I'm not going to present any data here. Um, hopefully, I've not used the word youngster, but because if I use the word youngsters, uh, I would sound older. So let me just use the word beginners. Uh, this is, you know, uh, a thing that is good for beginners to watch. I believe. Um, I hope uh, people get motivated and get some some lessons to learn out of my my mistakes uh, over the past few years since since the day I started uh, writing grant proposals and you know writing research papers and such things. So um, without any further ado, I would like to share my screen and start off because I think I'm going to overshoot my time, I believe. Um, let me share my presentation. All right, I hope you guys see my presentation. I will set a few things here before I begin. I like to present review. All right, and then I need this laser printer. There you go. All right. Um, yeah, I chose this topic. How did I get my research grants? mainly to pull you all guys who are in the beginning of their career and who would want to uh, venture into science and venture into research and write grant proposals and such things. Um, so I'm a professor at the University of Mississippi. The building that you see in the background is the Lyceum. This is the, the founding building on the campus. We have four such campuses. We have about 28,000 students on this campus, uh, not just pharmacy, it's all different um, programs, uh, liberal arts, engineering and everything. We have a medical school and we have a nursing school elsewhere. So we have like four different uh, campuses. Uh, this campus is mainly pharmacy and engineering. Um, so the pillars that you see represent the value system uh, on which the university is based and the same thing goes here on the logo also. You can see my contact information here, just in case if you have any questions, if I am um, not able to answer later, please note down and you can always uh, connect with me uh, via email. So this is the pharmacy school building and we have one and only in the nation, National Center for Natural Products Research, where a lot of uh, pharmacognosy works goes on. You know, this is the place where 
many pharmacognosists come here for doing postdoctoral and then um, eventually get promoted into uh, you know faculty positions and research scientist positions and such things so this huge building gets funded a lot to do particularly the marijuana research you know the, these days the cannabinoids are are uh, uh, in boom and there's a lot of research going on on cannabinoids so our university is one such place uh, which is approved for growing marijuana for research purpose so there's a lot of marijuana research going on uh, right here. And then I have another affiliation uh, that I would like to share with you. It's uh, Institute for Drug Delivery and Biomedical Research. This is a very small uh, not-for-profit research organization. We started this in 2013 uh, with a group of like-minded volunteers. You see the team members list here, Dr. Shobarani, who uh, was my uh, supervisor in PhD, Dr. Paranjyoti, um, Dr. Sarchija, and several other people uh, are all listed here. Um, very few like-minded people are all our volunteers. Um, so our main objective is to uh, foster research, help uh, students who are uh, willing to pursue their career in research or aspiring scientists and just offer mentorship um, to whatever level possible. We also do research and we, are, we write grant proposals as well. Uh, we have a number of publications, book chapters. We have secured several research grants so far. Uh, we outlicensed a couple of technologies to um, industry. And then uh, we, have, uh, we have been working uh, with industry uh, on a commercial partnership basis on three of the projects. We conduct a lot of outreach activities uh, like symposiums and community research programs uh, and such things, uh, community outreach programs and such things. And now we also believe that you know research is a culture and it should be inculcated at a very early uh, stage and we are penetrating into schools. Uh, we have some programs planned out to go into schools and and uh, you know um, teach the way the research need to be conducted just to attract the younger minds you know to to see research as a career in future you know we need more scientists in our nation and I I hear a lot of complaint that the youngsters are not really um, that attracted to the research um, field as much now nowadays because you know there is quick money in other places people are into management into industry into several other things so we need more scientists so that's our uh, one of our missions also we need to encourage people to come into um, science come into uh, research arena so that's our objective um, and then uh, this is a small facility as i mentioned we have uh, quite a few um, equipments gathered here, which are all research specific. The projects that are going on, um, you know, are uh, all uh, performed using the infrastructure and facilities that we have set up here. Um, we collaborate also. We, you know, we have uh, collaborations with the Engineering Institute of Science. We have collaboration with other colleges, um, several other uh, research organizations. We, you know, if any, if any, any sophisticated. Uh, equipment or you know high tech equipment is required. We always go elsewhere to to do that kind of research. We have number of collaborations, uh, collaborative research projects going on right now. So um, again, you know, for the beginners, when I started um, my career um, in in the teaching profession. I was at MS Ramaya College of Pharmacy. I was uh, just out of M Farm, and then I started teaching, and I wanted to go into PhD program, and then I wanted to write my own research grants. Um, there were lots of things in my mind, you know, research grants, research publications, um, a lot of things that I wanted to do, but um, I didn't know like what was uh, stopping me from going forward. There was some kind of an insecurity, some kind of a lack of um, um, initiative, um, lack of spirit uh, was there at that point of time. And then um, I also used to hear a lot of stories like, you know, research grants are not for guys like you, you know, it's only for people who work in big universities, you know, BITS and IIT and such things, and nobody would look at your proposals and such things. And uh, I even heard that time that, you know, people even lobby uh, in a bigger level and get the grants to their organizations and such things. All this, you know, that negative things would impact as an youngster at the age of 25, 24, 25, when you want to do something, when you hear all these things, you know, very demotivating, right? So I was struggling with all this 
um, mix, mixture of thoughts and uh, was wondering what to do. And there are two problems now, you know, like one is the problem within me. I don't know what the problem was. I need to fix that. Uh, the second is problem is with the system. Okay, so I have all kind of pessimism developed about the system, right? So there are two things to fix. So I don't know what to fix about myself because I don't know what was stopping me from going forward. Maybe some kind of an insecurity, um, some, some, some sort of um, uh, inhibition, okay? Um, so, okay, then what can I do? I can only um, think that, okay, let me give a shot. What most can happen at the most I may fail. I'm not going to die, right? So let me just buck up all the courage and, and try to give a shot, okay? So I was ready to give a shot. But what, what about the system? Okay, system is not giving giving um, a cooperation. You know, everybody's saying, oh, all these things are going on. A lot of lobbying is going on and that and this, right? So then I started thinking, this is how I think every beginner should think also. See, in this world, there are good people, bad people, right? We only look at the good people. We trust good people. We develop relationships with the good people. Um, we believe in good people and make our living. We don't keep looking at the bad people. We don't fear good, bad people. See, this, that's how the life goes on, right? So then I thought, okay, so if even God, okay, so even we know that there is a God who's good and there are evil powers, you know, which is bad. That's how we are brought up, you know, that, with that kind of a belief. Uh, we, we have not seen God. We have not seen the evils either, but still we believe in all these things. Okay, we, we look at God and live, make our living. We don't really fear for evils and, you know, for, forget about life, right? So uh, with this... Um, thought i thought okay so i need to form my belief system first okay so i need to we cannot fix the system anyway so i thought i love to have some kind of a belief system to go with okay so this is the belief system we still live with this is the belief system which started the uh, institute for drug development Bio biomedical research also our belief system is very simple just believing this the, the believing that this world is not full of bad people there are still nicer people there are people who value honesty and integrity there are people who, who recognize the individuality and there is value for merit, okay? Um, there is definitely good mentorship available. You know, if you want to seek mentorship, if you want to seek guidance, there are people, senior people um, who are ready to offer help and uh, there is respect for hard work and sincerity. This is what we need to believe in, right? If you don't believe in these values, if these, these things, um, then you cannot give a shot at all. You cannot explore at all, okay? So if you don't go with this belief system, then you know um, you will be all over the place. Okay, you will be back and forth on your on your actions. So um, so we we started thinking. Okay, so this is the way we should go, and you know let's let's give a shot. Okay, let's believe somebody will come for our help, and someone will recognize our research and such things. Okay, and then it's not like it was very easy. Like you know, I thought about all these things in one night, and you know, came up with oh well. Today I'm going to be positively, you know, I'm going to be with positive attitude, and I'm going to have a, a positive belief system. And from now onwards, I'm going to live with this. It's not so. It was all the time, back and forth, a bit shaky sometimes. Whenever you hear some news, you know, oh, yeah, well, whether I think I should give up and all that kind of a thing. Um, and and you know, the confidence used to go down sometimes, uh, particularly when you have a speaker. Um, he comes from WHO or some big university or some big organization, you know, um, and someone starts reading their bio data, like 20 page bio data, they start going, they start going on from the very educated, he educated in IIT, and then he did that and this in Harvard, and then, you know, he has so many publications and everything. So as he goes, the reader goes on and on and on about the person, the speaker, uh, the speaker is starts looking like a, a big mountain to you, right? So then you are becoming more and more smaller, okay? Exactly this feeling, okay? So I used to think like, oh, dude, would I even become 10% of what you are in this life? This feeling is, was this exactly was the feeling that I had whenever we had like, you know, speakers or accomplished people come into our college and, and give, give lectures. And, and believe me, even today, this, this feeling has not gone. Okay, so this this feeling should not go. Also, like this this is the feeling that really helps us to grow. Look up to people. Um, it's not a great feeling. It's it's not a very comfortable and a pleasant feeling. Definitely not. Okay, but um, this is a feeling good for you, for your career, for you to go go forward. Okay, so you should always keep looking up to people who are accomplished, um, who are you know far ahead in the path, um, and that that helps you to grow further. Okay. So for all the beginners out there, just in case, if they are thinking, you know, any
anything like this okay let me make everything different that i am not this big hanuman that you're seeing in this picture okay so there are certain things that we talk about when we go as speakers or when when we are introduced you know in some places okay things say that thing that i think the gap between you and me would get get reduced significantly and things that i generally talk like for example now dr raman dang spoke about is all the success with my research grants and the number of successful concepts and the number of publications and the guest lectures that we did and all those things like awards and several things right what we really don't talk about which is very important to you and also important to um, us both of us to have a lesser gap between us is what i do not talk about generally okay look at look at my success rate in research grant i'm only successful 30% so what this means is 70% of the research grants that i wrote are all trashed okay so um and then i think of an idea i go go back to lab i try something okay and then uh, i i try in multiple ways in you know i'm i'm very strong on this concept i, I believe in this concept but i try finally you know about 50% of the concepts that i i try only have come out positively okay 50% another 50% of the concepts completely failed and then uh, one other thing that i would like to tell you know 120 publications like this you know you might have heard 200 publications 500 publications i'll show you one more 3000 publications also in this presentation okay so uh, just look at the look at the number of papers the person has written see in this case in my case uh, only about 30% of the papers have got accepted in the first review okay may have number of papers okay only 30% of the papers have got accepted in the first review so that means i have struggled to get my papers in okay about 10% of the papers could not even make it into any journal does it make you any comfortable now right so i'm talking about my failures right so that should make you comfortable that should um, you know that should that should be making you think that oh well this guy is very not very different from us right i that's that's the whole purpose of telling all these things okay and let me tell you one more thing the first manuscript that i wrote to indian, uh, indian journal of pharmaceutical science came back five times okay and the sixth time i uh, thank god that the the editor had so much patience uh, to send back the paper you know to me with the review comments and then read through and finally he got the paper got accepted on the sixth time okay and then guest lectures yes i'm as nervous as a 10th grade kid who gives his finals without studying okay so every guest lecture is like uh, the first time thing for me okay so i'm 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 hopeful that you know so you know what i'm going through and what my success is based on Okay, so it's all based on a, a bunch of failures. So it's not like uh, um, any of the accomplished people are there in their place because they are smarter than you. It is just because they came early to the place. They took the first bus. Okay, when you are still standing in the queue, that's the only difference. So it's only the time. Okay, it's not like who's smarter, who's not smarter. Okay, so um, you might have heard about this. I have not failed. I have just found ten thousand ways that won't work. Thomas Edison's um you know great philosophy to experiment this damn philosophy works only for experimentation this damn philosophy is not going to work for life okay so let us be realistic let us every time when we fail let us not think that oh we found 10000 ways of finding how we can fail no that's not the way if you have failed you accept your failure you try to fix it uh, you have to have patience everything is going to take time okay you have to go back perseverance is the secret of success we have to um you know be at it okay multiple times go back keep trying um until until you are successful so i'm not showing this thomas edison's um statement here to uh, for you to you know adapt as a philosophy of life this this is not going to be uh, uh, you know of any use in research failure is failure so when you're when you're happy when you're successful you can be sad when you're failed failed also so you have to think how to fix it okay so one failure people just give up that's not a good attitude okay we have to have persistent persistent effort so i i'm, I'm sure many of the scientists uh, you know uh, who are who are uh, accomplished or seniors here um, in the group would, would agree with me so they have seen several failures also it is just that you know uh, everybody has a story okay so just that uh, people don't get an opportunity to talk all these things to a bigger mass they may be talking all these things to their group members their students and colleagues okay so now 
I have uh, everything in place. Just now I was talking to uh, Dr. Vandana uh, before the presentation. So she was telling like, we have everything, but what is stopping the uh, beginners to, you know, kickstart their journey. Okay, I feel highly motivated now. As this is was this is what I was thinking at that point of time. I, was, I feel very highly motivated, strongly believing in the belief system. Okay, so I have framed up belief system. I'm good with it. And then I now know that the successful people have seen terrible failures in their life. I'm very very well aware of it. I even know that you know I if I mind I if I work hard I can be successful. I know that everybody knows. All the beginners know that in their mind if they work hard they can be successful. Okay. Um, and I have all the details. I have Dr. Vandana's uh, presentation on my table. Okay, I have all the details of all the funding agencies, not only across the nation, all that is available under the sun across the globe. Whatever uh, funding agencies uh, are you know uh, are there, and what what all funding schemes are available under every funding agency, all that is listed in uh, Dr. Vandana's presentation. I, I was just looking around for something she left, but she did not leave anything under the sun. Okay, so so good. That that's a great uh, place to start. So all you need to do is, you know, again visit her website once again, click on the links and look at the grant programs and begin. Okay, and then you have a great. Everybody thinks they have a great research idea. So my idea is great for me. Your idea is great for you. We don't know who's. I mean, we cannot judge on each other. So we have to, unless we write the grant proposal and send it for review, you wouldn't know whether it is really uh, a good idea or not. You will have to get some review comments and then you know some criticisms you have to address those you have to take them you know from a constructive perspective and then only you would know whether it is a, a great idea or not so you have to make an attempt i have everything in place but what is stopping me what's the biggest question what is the biggest question what what do the beginners think is the biggest question where should i start where should i start is the biggest question Okay, so people always, um, um, you know, wonder uh, which, you know, when should I start? Where should I start? And how how should I start? Is is, is like are the three biggest questions that people, um, you know, uh, face when they want to start with. Okay, so this is what I had also, and then I wrote a couple of proposals. I made somehow I made an attempt when I was in uh, Bangalore, and then uh, I had to come here to United States to do my postdoctoral research. I did my postdoctoral research at Russell Park Cancer Institute, Buffalo, New York. Um, so under uh, Dr. Sekwin Hui. So the, the picture you see here is Dr. Sekwin Hui. He is from Hong Kong. He, uh, he was from Hong Kong. And then he did a lot of research in biophysics area. He was a membrane biophysicist at Russell Park Cancer Institute. Um, and he did a lot of cancer research also. Um, he, he's, a, he's a very renowned uh, personality in the biophysics area, basically, not much in, in uh, pharmaceutics area or pharmacy area rather. Okay, and then, um, so I, I finished my postdoctoral for one year. And then when I was, I, I, this, this ambition to write grant proposal and establish myself as an independent researcher was, was still there, you know, it's not, it's not, it was not dying. So one day when we were um, sitting um, at a restaurant and having coffee, uh, I just brought up this matter to Steve. So Steve is the American name of uh, Sequin Hui. Generally, most of the Chinese in Hong Kong, uh, Taiwanese people will have, a, have an American name um, because it's hard to pronounce their names. So uh, I used to call him Steve. So uh, then I brought, brought this uh, question up to him. I told him, hey, Steve, I want to write a grant proposal. He was very excited. And then he said, oh, well, yeah, you can write. So what topic do you want to propose? Okay. And that time, cancer research was, um, you know, uh, even now, cancer research is in, is in high priority. So that time, the targeted drug delivery systems was, you know, just coming up about 15, 20 years ago, uh, just uh, coming up. And then many people were doing research in the cancer area, nanoparticulate drug delivery system, targeted drug delivery, active passive targeting, and EPR mechanism, and all those things were, were uh, in, in discussion that time. So I told him, like, I want to, I want to work on some targeted drug delivery system. Um, he said, "Oh yeah, great, but uh, I have another question." Okay, so he asked me five questions. I'm going to bring up one by one. Okay, do you have a track record in the field that you're proposing? Um, well, I was uh, like, well, you know, I did not work on cancer before. If I get funding, I would do. And he said, "No, that's not the way the funding um, mechanism works." 
okay you have to definitely have an area in which you have done some research okay you should always uh, you know propose as a beginner propose something uh, in the field that you have already have you have, you, have, you have some track record in it okay so that's preferable okay it's not that you should not deviate from this i'm only um, telling you the most likely chances or most likely cases okay so you should you should have proposed something in the, in a, in the area that you have explored for quite some time and then uh, I thought about it and then I went back and I told him, uh, well, Steve, now I want to work on uh, nail fungus, you know, so he nail fungus problem was uh, quite prevalent at that time and many companies were working on developing a drug delivery system to treat um, anicomycosis. Anicomycosis is the fungus, fungal infection of the nail and people were working on, on that. Um, so uh, I, I said, I want to work on that. And then he asked me, is that a novel idea? The idea that you are coming with, I, I understand that you want to work on this particular disease, but is that is the idea um, novel? Okay, so is that topic already uh, people have you know explored quite a bit and beaten to death already, or is it something really novel? Okay, so, so I asked him, what do you mean by novel? He said, look, how many people are dying because of this disease? I was like, uh, not many. Um, then he said, then why would NIH or anybody would think? Um, that they would they would want to fund you over you know other uh, researchers who are working on some debilitating issues some serious problems right so he said you should you should have proper significance okay it should have a proper um, significance making an impact on the society it should be uh, either filling a knowledge gap in the science or it should be improving the quality of life of patients, something of that sort, okay? So it should have some kind of a significance. Otherwise, there is no point in, in doing any research, okay? And then, um, and then I, again, I took some time. I uh, did some literature search and everything, and then I went back, I told him, uh, Steve, I got an idea now. So what, what is the idea? So he asked me, and then I, I told him like, you know, we, I work on electroporation. I did a lot of work on electroporation in his lab, electroporation of uh, skin for delivery of drug. I said like, I want to sample the drugs from skin, maybe useful for therapeutic drug monitoring, or maybe uh, to study the dermal kinetics of drug. Um, so our interest was to look into the dermal kinetics of drugs in his lab. So um, he said, okay. Uh, but do you have any proof of concept of, of data? Okay, so that means you have some some data generated to show that this novel concept, if nobody has worked on this, this novel concept would work. Okay, do you have some proof of concept? I said, no, I don't have, but I'm pretty confident that this is going to work. Again, he said like, this is not the way it's going to work. Okay, you cannot just simply propose something that you imagined that you dreamt in the night. No, this is not going to work go back, work in the lab for six months, generate some preliminary data, and then you write your proposal, okay? So from this discussion, the lessons that I learned, create a track record in few research areas, first of all, okay? So you got to have like maybe two or three main areas or mainstream areas identified. You cannot have 25, 35 research areas. There are too many for one life to handle, okay? I met a few people, you talk about any research area, they say, I work on it. Okay, that's, that's not the way it's gonna work, okay? So it takes lifetime to learn one subject, okay? So maybe one or two or three at the most, if you're a bachelor and not going home uh, on time, you can have five research areas at the most, okay? So that's, that's the max you can go up to, okay? And then um, propose a topic in the area in which you have uh, some level of expertise. You should, you should always have a track record. You should propose in the area that you've worked on. The idea should be novel. It should have enough significance, significance in the sense it should have an impact on the field, in the, on the community, or quality of patients, or some kind of a paradigm shift, breakthrough, some kind of thing, okay? So, and then do not submit grant proposal without adequate preliminary data. Okay, okay I got all these lessons. I wrote my grant proposal. And then I took him, I did some work, okay, so I published a paper. I took the grant proposal to Steve. He saw the grant proposal. He jumped out of his chair, okay, because I had some 10 objectives written in it. I had uh, some 50 pages grant proposal written. He said, Murthy, do you even know that this is an elephant, okay? I said, I understand it is an elephant, but it takes so much, you know, I have to write so much to convince the reviewer that this is a subject that, that is worth funding. And then he said, 10 objectives is too many. And moreover, this is too technical for anybody to understand. Do you even know how the review review process works? In the review pro uh, panel, you have people from 
different areas okay they are all not not like you know experts in transdermal delivery experts in electroporation electric uh, expert in pharmacokinetics no they don't come with the same expertise that you have they are all you know from different areas different arenas uh, basic science and different people okay so when they get your proposal on their table okay the the perception would be like this basically okay whatever they understand they perceive your grant to be that right so somebody thinks that your uh, you know your, your proposal is uh, you know as thin as a tail or as thick as a trunk that's not a good thing for you okay so i said yeah understand but he said like this is really an elephant i said what is the problem in submitting an elephant he said it could be an elephant but it should be of the size that the reviewer can get a grip on right it should be of the size that the reviewer can can get a sense of its form and shape it cannot be simply so huge that they don't understand okay in terms of complexity i'm talking i hope you are getting it right it's not like in in terms of in, in terms of volume i'm talking right it's not 50 pages or 10 pages in terms of complexity you have to keep things pretty simple okay if you have to if you have to make reviewers understand okay get a perception on the on the grant proposal you have to keep things simple you have to keep it realistic okay discuss about the limitations discuss about the alternatives discuss about how you want to overcome keeping realistic is is very important okay simply don't project that your your idea is going to take over the world no every every concept has its own ups and downs so you have to discuss all these things okay and then how you plan to um, you know um, work around this problem and what is your backup plan and such things okay and don't be over ambitious over ambitious in in the sense like you have some 10 objectives 20 objectives for a two year grant is it even possible really so that was his his, uh, his take on it okay so over ambitious he meant like it is too many objectives you want to do for $100,000 grant proposal $100,000 grant money you want to do preclinical clinical whatever you know pharmacodynamic pharmacokinetics that's not going to happen okay you're only just somehow want to get trying to somehow want to get the grant but you don't know uh, if you will be really able to manage the grant and manage to perform all the work that you're proposing within the budget within the grant money that you're going to get so i learned all these lessons these are very important lessons for any beginner okay keep things simple keep things realistic and be transparent and don't be over ambitious okay so then i wrote my uh, i published this is the paper electroporation and transcutaneous extraction i'm showing you these things just to let you know that you know all these are real stories and now i'm not just cooking up just to uh, ignite you up okay so this is the uh, paper that i published on electroporation was used for transcutaneous sampling of drug from the skin um, as a tool to look at the pharmacokinetics of drug in the in the skin and then i wrote up the grant proposal what you see here is the nih ERA Commons page where you see the grant proposal. You can see the title, the same title here: Electroporation Transcutaneous Extraction. Electroporation Transcutaneous Extraction, and this was the um, award notice. Okay, so this is how um, this is how I got my first research grant funded. Okay, so I hope some there's some some lesson going from here to there. Um, people are making note and and uh, will follow when they write the grant proposals in future. And then um, there is always uh, you know. Uh, what research area this question okay always comes up what research area should i work on and there's all kinds of myths around right so people think that latest technologies tend to have higher funding chances okay so always nanotech okay nanotech seems like a magic bullet anything doesn't work put nanotech okay so then people would get fascinated by the word nanotech and it's not so okay so complexity is there for a, a purpose it should be it should be uh, used only to serve some unique purposes for example targeted drug delivery system okay so possibly you can you can propose a nanotech based, nanotech based uh, drug delivery technology but not for skin permeation enhancement and you show that you made some solid lipid nanoparticles and you got some two fold enhancement in the drug delivery across the skin really so if you use just propylene glycol you get five times the enhancement so then what is the purpose right why do you want to complex uh, why, do, why do you want to make things complex right so so just think about um, the real need you know of that that sophisticated technology or high-tech tech that you are using you are proposing 
before before you go forward and generate the preliminary data on okay so and then um, also people think that using sophisticated techniques would would fetch me points just just writing i'm using hptlc mass spec in a place where it is not at all required where you can manage with hplc uh, these these myths uh, are still around you know people think that i wrote even mass spec but i didn't get a grant proposal uh, that's not what fetches you points and uh, anything we write about the current crisis this i've heard now you know covid 19 you write anything about covid 19 you get funded no 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 the reviewers are not not uh, you know foolish people sitting there they view everything scientifically um, you know based on rational and then only they would fund don't don't simply get carried away by these words that oh yeah current crisis anything you write i will get no no that's not the way it works okay so please keep your research area a research idea relevant Okay, relevant and unique in, is the way to go. Okay, so I'll just give you an example. See, I, I um, worked, I had an idea on anemia, okay? Um, so anemia uh, is a huge problem in developing countries, okay? And then I kind of, I, that, I was very excited and I got the preliminary data also quite well. And then I wrote up grant proposal in uh, United States. Look at the, this, this map here shows the prevalence of anemia across the globe and the least prevalence you see in United States, okay? When I proposed here, they didn't even look at the grant proposal. You know, what was the reason given? This is not a problem that we are bothered about here, okay? This is a problem that exists in poor countries, developing countries, go propose there, not here, okay? It's a great idea, no wonder it's great. No, I mean, no no doubt that it's, it's, a, it's a great idea, but the problem is, you know, we don't really fund anemia research because not many kids are really suffering with anemia here. And then as uh, the same ground proposals, when we when we submitted here in India, there in India, I'm sorry, I'm, I should have been in India now, that's what I'm saying myself there. Okay, so in India through IDBR, we got not one, two fundings, okay, to, to do anemia research because anemia is a great problem. You see that uh, the whole of India is in red. Okay, it's, it's uh, still a continuing problem um, in India. So uh, now, um, so let's see how uh, how to write a grant proposal. Before that, let me let me tell you how the review process, how how the whole process goes on, right? So literally, we have to know like how the whole process goes on, right? There are different stages. So you write the grant proposal. The grant proposal generally has multiple components in it, right? Uh, you have a scientific section. In the, and then you have a budget, you have compliance issues, compliance, compliance matters that you need to write about. And there is an administrative section. There are several things that constitute your grant proposal. And then you submit it, it undergoes in the review process, sometimes is uh, uh, one step and sometimes it is second step, or you may have to take your proposal through the third step also. And it depends on the funding agency. Okay, so let me make it clear upfront to you guys that you know I'm not only talking in, the context of United States. Okay, so I am probably uh, one of the few people who have experience writing grant proposals both in the United States as well as in India. Um, so uh, I think, you know, all this what I'm uh, discussing is applicable both the places in the United States as well as in India, more from the Indian context. Okay, so we submit the grant proposal, it goes through the primary review, you may get remarks, um, uh, you know, they may ask you to collaborate with some industry collaborator or something, you know, they're always willing, I, I see that most of the grant, you know, granting agencies are always willing to work with the investigators and fix their problems and ask them to put the proposal back in. And then, you know, if, if you can make it through the primary review, then it will go through the secondary review. In the secondary review, it's most likely that you will be called for a presentation. Okay, so uh, you don't have to be a great presenter. Uh, you just have to um, be capable of just conveying the concept and conveying, you know, what is there. On, it's, it's not like one hour presentation or anything. It's just about five minutes, seven minutes, 15 minutes presentation because they don't have so much time because they would have hundreds of proposals to review. Okay, and then if you make it through, then you get funded. It's not over with this, okay? So the actual real challenge has, starts only after you get the funding. Okay, you have to, um, you know, once you execute the contract, you have to execute the project and you have to keep submitting the progress reports and then budget management is, a, is a, another huge task. Okay, so you, has, you also have to be very transparent uh, to these funding agencies because anytime if they uh, come to know that um, you did not utilize the funds appropriately. Uh, they, 
they are going to blacklist you. Okay, so be very careful about these things. So be staying transparent throughout the process, being realistic throughout the process is the best approach in, in any anything that we do. And then uh, let's look at the main components of the grant proposal. How are we doing with the time? 35 minutes up already. Okay. Um, so the main components of the grant proposal, um, introduction, backgrounds, see whether they ask or not. These are the main components, okay? So they might, they might term it differently, but these are the things that are required in a grant proposal. You need an introduction, background, you have to discuss your objectives, innovation, definitely whether they ask or not, say they may term it as like, you know, IP situation and that this, okay? But it's basically innovation and you have to have sufficient preliminary data, whether they ask or not, you have to give preliminary data to give them confidence that your concepts work. Experimental design, uh, you know, that's again, very important designing of experiment, limitations and alternatives. This is an important thing that I, that you know, most of us don't really consider. Okay, like for example, you think that you are doing a pharmacokinetic studies and the blood samples can be analyzed by HPLC. So you propose HPLC because you don't want to propose mass spec uh, upfront. If you propose mass spec, you are committed to do mass spec. You will have to do mass spec. You don't have a mass spec, but you don't mind doing mass spec in case if it if it comes to it, right? So then you should you don't don't care. You can write that you are going to use HPLC, but in the limitations and alternatives uh, section, you can write okay, I've proposed HPLC, just in case the concentrations go below the LOQ, then you know, I may have to use mass spec and I'm ready to use. And I have found a place where I can go and use the mass spec and do all this analysis. Okay. So that's what limitations and alternatives is. Okay. Backup plan. This is, this is always required. Okay. So you propose everything may not work, right? So you should have a backup plan. So that gives them a bit more of a confidence in you, uh, you know, and go forward and they, you know, they consider your proposal. And then timeline and budget, I don't have much to say about, you know, if they say 18 months, don't propose 50 months. Uh, if they say 20 lakhs, uh, if the project costs 10 lakhs, propose 10 lakhs. If the project costs uh, 50 lakhs, then you're not fitting to this particular grant mechanism. Investigators, a very important thing. I'm going to discuss investigators later. So let me take up one by one. The introduction and background, I'll leave it to you. Just I want to make one remark here. I have seen introduction and background written like a review paper. Please don't do that. Okay. Say so you want to explore what example shall I take? Turmeric. Okay. Turmeric as an anti-cancerous drug. Okay. Turmeric, again, you know, people have uh, explored it, explored it in all different dimensions. They have beaten it to death. Right. So we know that. Right. But you want to do research on, on uh, turmeric. So you should discuss about why do you think turmeric, uh, why, why do you think the turmeric would work in that particular condition? What other drugs are being used for that particular condition? What advantage would turmeric have if, if it is used to treat that condition over the other drugs that are available. That's what the background information is. Don't start off with, you know, turmeric was used in Southern India by women, you know, as a cosmetic. That's, that's not required. Okay, so all that irrelevant information, don't review, uh, you know, it is there in our custom, uh, Charaka did and Chushuta did, don't, that's not required at all. Okay, that's not the background information that you have to, you have to discuss about. Okay, so objectives. So there are only um, generally, you know, we limit to two to three objectives, may go up to five if it's a five year project. You should be specific and aiming at assessing the hypothesis. Okay, so um, people write uh, like, you know, uh, development of analytical method is one objective. The extraction of uh, alcoholic extract of something, osmum sanctum, is the second objective. That's not the way. Okay, so those are the things that you are going to do anyway, right? They cannot be your objectives. They cannot be your main objectives. Your man, main objective is you have a hypothesis that osmum sanctum works on some kind of a breast cancer, right? So your, your objective should be around that hypothesis. It should be testing. It should be assessing the hypothesis. Not like I'm going to grow asimum sanctum, I'm going to characterize asimum sanctum for all its chemical constituents um, and all that kind of thing, okay? And then um, objective should cover uh, things like method, model, expected outcome, etc. So you can also add a description. I've given one of my grant proposal specific aim. Um, so to evaluate the lead topical formulation of some drug, in Volvodynia induced mice model. Okay, so look at the objective. I did not write that I am going to develop an analytical method for NM234. And then I did not write, I'm going to set up the animal model and test with the positive, positive control drugs. And then this, no, not so. Directly hit 
the hypothesis with your objective. And then you can add a description, okay? In the description, you have to pretty much include everything that the reviewer want to read in a grant proposal. Like for example, the model, animal model, okay? So I'm gonna create a candida albicans, a Wolverdinia model using candida albicans, okay? So this is not a model that I am setting up. This is a standard model that has already been published. I'm only using this model with the reference, okay? What devices am I using to evaluate the uh, you know allodynia um, allodynia effect of the drug okay so plantar anesthesiometer okay and then um, what is the negative control what is the positive control you're going to use and if possible who's going to do the work because you're going to include his bio data in the in the proposal so you can mention who's going to do this and then what will, what is the expected outcome these are the things that are supposed to go in the objectives okay innovation so innovation means people freak out. They think that it is patent, okay? So it does not always mean you have to have a patent. If you have a patent, it's good, but it does not always mean you have to have a patent, okay? It could be like something like filling the knowledge gap in the field. Okay, I've given an example. We found that vigabatrin um, gets absorbed into back of the eye through the tauti transporters, okay? So this is a, a significant uh, knowledge gap being filled, okay? So then further people can think about the potential ways of blocking vigabatrin going into the back of the eye because vigabatrin causes retinal toxicity, okay? So there is nothing to patent here, but this definitely, this is a new finding. Nobody knew how vigabatrin gets absorbed into the back of the eye. We found that there is a pathway. Um, so then definitely this is something that that is worth exploring, okay? Because the potential solution to this problem would only come if you know the mechanism. Right, and then obvious finding, but not a novel application. Okay, you have an antifungal drug. People have explored, um, you know, its antifungal activity across different strains of fungus, um, but they did not explore uh, its activity against terubrum. You found that it is active active against terubrum. You terubrum is the nail fungus basically. Okay, and then you want to develop the uh, formulation, topical formulation to treat uh, nail fungus. This is definitely a novel application. This drug may be around. People may be knowing that it is an antifungal drug. You cannot get a patent on this because this is an obvious finding because people have already proved that it's antifungal, but they did not know that it is active against terobrum. You found it and it is a potential nail formulation. Okay, so it is a potential uh, molecule to treat the nail fungus. So definitely this is a novel application. Okay, and then you also have to make sure that you use appropriate language, the words when you're writing the grant proposal to indicate the novelty, like, you know, breakthrough, uh, potential solution, unmet medical need, and first of its kind, and several such words, you know, they probably may know better punch words than I do. Okay. And then uh, I talked about preliminary data already. Preliminary data is very important, uh, except for some grant proposals, which are of high risk, high reward type. Okay. High risk, high reward type, where the granting agency does not care whether the, pro whether the uh, proposed idea works uh, or not at the beginning okay so whether, whether it is it is worth spending on it or not because this problem is so um, so important or it's such a crisis that they would want to invest at any cost and make the investigators to work on it if something works it's good if something doesn't work then it's okay too so that kind of a grant proposals you may not have to uh, put in a lot of preliminary data, but otherwise most of the grant proposals, you need the preliminary data. You should have adequate preliminary data to support your objectives. You should show that you have all things in place to hit the ground running. And you may also include all this, you know, uh, analytical method. These are not the objectives analytical method, the model, the validation of the model, uh, mechanistic studies, and all those things can go into the preliminary data. Just to give you an example, okay, we looked at the barrier function of skin when we use the acupuncture needles. So this was in association with University of Maryland. Um, we did some medical school, we did some uh, experiments. So here, the acupuncture needles are used to puncture the skin. You all know how acupuncture works, right? So we were interested in looking at how would the barrier, skin barrier, barrier gets ruptured and then how would it reform, okay? Then, you know, my preliminary data section would look like this. Proof of concept for specific M1. This is specific M1, right? So proof of concept for specific M1. And I have the data relevant to this showing that there is a barrier damage, right? So you propose that there is going to be barrier damage and I want to look at the barrier damage and the recovery without showing that there is a barrier damage, nobody would believe it, right? So you have to you have to have some preliminary data showing that there is potential barrier damage, 
and then you know i had other data that was showing that there could be some recovery using the barrier recovery agents also so this is how you have to align your um, specific games and the uh, proof of concept data or the preliminary data so another example so we we worked on a technology called a strap drive antiphoresis uh, which is used for driving the drug into the subdermal muscle tissue okay so for this uh, we had all kind of preliminary data. We showed that you know all the other methods did not work as good as the trap drive work. Okay, so look at the title: proof of concept for trap drive technology. Preliminary studies: proof of concept for trap drive technology. So you have to align it, you know, in in uh, sync with the aims or objectives that you propose in your grant proposal. So we looked at. Introduction, background, objectives, innovation, preliminary data, experimental design, I'm going to give, leave it to you. Limitations, I explained to you. Timeline, budget, I'm not going to discuss much. The next thing is investigators. So this is a very big thing, okay? So I uh, have all kinds of experience with the investigators. Um, so collaboration is definitely required only when it is absolutely necessary, okay? definitely is going to be helpful only if it's absolutely necessary you have you don't have a certain skill set you find somebody else has that skill set you can involve that person in your grant proposal you can subcontract that work work to him it's better he does the work than you do it you learn and do it right so he's an expert in it so let him do that work so that you get a genuine data right if you learn and do it you don't know whether you're doing it right or wrong so in such a case we need a, a good uh, um, you know collaborators so investigate with a good um, CV, with a good uh, track record um, is very important. So they should be good team players also. These personality traits are very important. They should be good team players also, committed to the goal, come with different skill sets, you know, and they should be ready to share the knowledge, share the credit, and, and most importantly, take the responsibility, okay? If an experiment fails, they should be able to go back and try again and see what went wrong. They cannot say, okay, you paid money me, money to me just to do the experiment one trial, you know, one time, and I did only one time, it failed, and I don't know why it failed. This is not going to help you, okay? So you have to have really responsible um, uh, investigators, okay? So people talk about multidisciplinary um, collaboration. Yes, multidisciplinary is the way to go. Even our IDBR, we have a lot of, uh, um, collaborations, you know, multidisciplinary. I'm going to bring up some examples and show you how we how we work. Um, but two uh, way apart uh, disciplines, people from way apart disciplines, uh, is not going to help. It's going to become like this, basically, right? You see, one guy is doing something here. They all are multidisciplinary, and then one guy probably is a nature lover or a botanist. He's looking at uh, outside the window. This lady probably is a yoga person. And of all the characters, the one I love is this guy, even in this chaos, he's having such a sound sleep, right? How many scientists can do this? So the multidisciplinary cannot be like this. They should all sing together. They should all have common goal. They should all be uh, interested in the area that you are proposing. So that then only it'll, it'll work, okay? So teamwork is the way to go. Definitely, you know, people should be active. You see all these people are very active, but what is what is going on here is the, all the responsibility is on the head of the principal investigator. This is not a good teamwork. This is not a good example for the teamwork, a good teamwork at all. Okay, so a good teamwork should be like, you know, they should be putting in, weighing in, you know, equal amount of efforts from their end, whatever, you know, whatever they are meant for in this project, they should be doing it. Okay, so this is a good example for a good teamwork, right? All are doing their part. Okay, all are doing their part. And the principal investigator is, is taking care of the main business. This is a great teamwork, right? So this is how the collaboration should go on. But you know, as I mentioned, all these collaborators are very efficient. They're all working in team and everything is good. But what if they uh, are not, take, not of the type who take the responsibility? What I mean by taking responsibility? They should be available for due diligence. They should be. They should come and explain what they did. Okay. If they leave everything on the PI, that's not a good thing. Okay. And when the, when the funding agency people come for due diligence, if they all escape you know, leaving you uh, hanging off the gr ground, uh, you will be in trouble, okay? The funding agency is going to take, take you for a task. This is not a good collaboration either, okay? They all do the work, but they also take the responsibility is what really is required, okay? And then I have another example. So we've synthesized a novel polymer 
we struggled for 15 days, almost like a month, I think. And then we prepared some 20 milligrams of the polymer. We had a collaborator, okay. The collaborator was interested in some kind of a surface uh, phenomena. Uh, but he had a rheometer. We wanted to do the rheological studies of that polymer and I gave him that polymer. I asked him to do the rheology, okay? But he got so fascinated by the polymer and he started using it for his studies, a surface phenomena. He's a great scientist, okay? He has all the expertise and everything, but his interests are different, okay? So if you have uh, a right person in the wrong uh, uh, place, this is what is gonna happen. Okay, so this physicist is interested in doing pendulum experiment, but he's, he's using a lot, wrong model. Okay, he is working on the pe pendulum experiments on my precious kids. This is not a good scenario. You don't want a wrong person in your in your uh, uh, collaboration in your team. Okay, he does his own things. Okay, he may be an expert in in the area that you want him to be, but he he is not doing the right thing for you. Okay, so this is not a good thing. Okay, and then we had another situation at IDBR, okay, Institute for Drug Delivery Biomedical Research. Okay, we signed an MOU with a, with an university. Okay, um, so this collaborator was a very bossy collaborator. Okay, he's like all the time asking for uh, reports, particularly the vice chancellor. He used to think like he is a king and he would ask me every month, where's the report? Where is the update? Where is the update? Every month I would have to give him the update. Okay, so this, this guy used to really think like he's Ramanasur, okay. Um, then at some point we had to again go back and make it clear to him, um, dude, you, you may be the king, but you're only king in your uh, damn little island, which is your university. And that's not the way the collaboration works. Collaboration is always mutual and we have to, you know, put in equal efforts, equal uh, time and, you know, everything uh, together, okay? And then only you can make this project possible. So you have to be very careful with, uh, you know, with the selection of uh, investigators because teamwork uh, is the only way and the teamwork is possible only if you have appropriate uh, people. We had another grant pr proposal, uh, I mean, the grant funded. We worked on programmable electrophoresis device for drug delivery across biological barriers. We, do, we designed an electrically mediated device. So obviously it required the expertise from uh, electrical engineering uh, department. Mm, we collaborated with uh, one of the premier institutes in, in India, in, in Bangalore. Um, and then uh, we got a great dude. And then that guy was like uh, really good in subject. He used to work, whenever he works, he works like a monster. Okay. He works like a monster. He was really good. Okay. So whenever he works, he was really on it. Okay. But the problem is to make him work. We really had to do all these things. Okay. Blow trumpets and, you know, beat drums and whatnot. Okay. This guy had this typical uh, um, sleeping sickness problem and he used to be awake only four hours uh, in a day. And uh, it's okay, that's his problem. And his body constitution requires 20 hours of sleep that I don't have any problem, but these four hours that he used to be awake was random during the day, anytime, sometimes early in the morning, sometimes in the middle of the night. So uh, to catch him was a big problem. He never had phone signal. Then we had to replace this guy. Don't ever hesitate to replace the collaborator if he's not doing the thing that he has to do, okay? So you have to be ready for all these things. And then we had to replace him with some other person who did a great job and brought out those uh, you know, devices, okay? And then uh, sometimes uh, people ask me, um, do I really need a collaborator or a mentor? Okay, so I, a mentor is, is great. I always uh, recommend having a mentor because I have a number of mentors in India. Um, so uh, in India particularly, and I uh, have academic mentor like Shobarani, Dr. Shobarani here I met and uh, uh, have an industrial mentor like uh, Dr. Paranjyoti Kani. And uh, here in the United States, I have several mentors. Uh, it's, it's always better to have a mentor. A mentor collaborator is even better. Okay, if he's collaborating as well as he's, he's advising you, that's, that's even better. It, it all depends on the equation that you share with the person. Anybody whom you think is better than you, that's very important. You should think that somebody is better than you. Okay, so that's the main task, right? So that's the main problem with many of the people. They don't think that anybody is better than them. So you have to think if somebody is better than you and uh, you have to go to them to seek help, seek advice. Um, and this, this really works very well in Indian scenario. You go to any senior person, um, you say, I need you as guide, I need your uh, help in your, I, seek your guidance, they would, you know, put aside uh, their personal work and help you. This, they really like that sentiment in India. That doesn't work in, in the Western world. You go to somebody, um, say, hey, Chris, I need your help. And they say, oh, great. But, you know, I don't uh, 
um, I wish I had time to help you. You know, I'm so sorry. You can go to that guy. You can go to this guy. Uh, finally, it doesn't happen because the guy whom he's directing is also his friend. So I know what, what response he's going to give. So they don't really care the sentiment, okay? So of uh, guiding people and such things. So it really works well in, in Indian scenario. Try this, it's going to uh, really help the beginners. Uh, even philosophically, it's, it's always good to have somebody as your mentor, you know, that keeps you humble and, and uh, um, always correct you, you go back and discuss your, your problems and you know, correct your mistakes and such things. I have a great uh, mentor here in the United States. Okay. I get really highly inspired by him. His name is Dr. Howard Maybach. I don't know how many of you have heard. He's a dermatologist, but he worked extensively on topical drug delivery systems. He's the person. Okay. Dr. Maybach is about uh, 90 plus years of age now, and um, he is still studious and highly energetic. Um, so he, he attends every conference call uh, that I do with the USFDA. Uh, he gives me inputs and all those things. We even wrote some uh, books also. He has published uh, about 3000 research papers. Okay, This is a, a record, I think world record. Um, for the number of publications. And he did not, because he was publishing so many papers, he did not have enough time to publish books. He only published 450 books. Okay. So um, I was fortunate enough to uh, have one of the books edited with him on the nail, uh, nail fungal disease and such things. Okay. We are, I think, um, past 57 minutes. I am moving into funding from industry. Raman, are we okay? Yeah, yeah, we are okay, Murthy. We are enjoying your session. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so people ask uh, this question, like how can we get the funding from industry, right? So beginners, um, this is a common thing. We can write grant proposals to funding agencies. It will take a long time uh, to hear anything from them and all that. So industry is a quick uh, route to get funding for your research. Why would industry fund you? Think about it. They're all for-profit organization, right? So why would they fund you unless they get some benefit out of it, right? Don't don't expect them to give you a charity. They won't do that, okay? So they they may do, do a charity only through their foundations just to you know save tax or something like that, okay? Uh, they would fund you only to uh, get themselves educated, not for your education, not for your children's education, not for your students' education. It is for them in case if they want to want to you know get educated in some some area, some discipline, then they would fund you and they would ask you to give give them a talk or maybe you know do some work for them or anything. Okay, most of the time it is a contract would basically right. So they would want you to develop something for them. They would uh, want you to troubleshoot or they would uh, 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 you know ask you to work on something for validation purpose. They worked on something. They found that one of the chemicals is extensively uh, you know, working as a moisturizing agent. They would bring that chemical to you and ask you to do the same experiments and, and endorse it, right? So maybe you can, you can uh, do the same experiments and say it works and for that you can collect money. That's basically a contract, right? It's an industry contract. So what are different ways you can work with industry? You can work um, in the... Uh, with a collaboration, you know, with the industrial collaboration um, in, in the farm, in, in about five farms that I've listed here, maybe multiple ways, multiple other ways also are possible. These are the five ways that I've been working on. Okay. So basically you are going to take the concept and talk to them. You know, you have some novel concept. You just, you know, pick up the phone, talk to them and tell that you have something great idea, have a disclosure, um, you know, non uh, confidentiality agreement rather. Okay, uh, confidentiality agreement uh, signed with them before you discuss the idea with them and then tell that this is the idea that you can work on. Probably that's useful to them. That's that they can take it into market or something like that, you know? So you have an idea that you want them to take interest or get interested, you need to go and propose to them, you need to market it, okay, to the industry. So basically you should have something like a, a salesperson's approach in this case, when you want to get an industrial funding, okay. Working with industry as a core developer of the product, okay, you have a great product idea and you, you want to develop it just for the sake of developing it because you don't have the capability to manufacture and market it, okay, but they, the industry can do it. 
they, they, um, they, would, they would fund you and you would develop the product and probably, you know, you're a university or you personally can share um, some profit of it, maybe in the form of royalty or upfront funding. That's, that's possible also. And contract project projects, okay? So you can go and ask them if they have any contract projects. They say, uh, well, you know, we are facing a problem stability issue with uh, tacrolimus. Can you go check, you know, whether you can solve this problem? That's a good contract for you, okay? So you use your brain, you solve the stability problems of tacrolimus, um, and then you take it to them. You know, they fund you the, for the whole process. So that's one other way is, is possible to work with the industries. Okay, again, I'm, I'm making a point. This is not something that works works only in the United States. This is the way we've been working at IDBR, even with the uh, with the companies within India. Okay, not not uh, US. We are working with some of the companies in US also, but within India also we have some collaborations. We did a lot of research for them. Okay, and then some open-ended research grants that requires for you to establish your name and uh, uh, network. Um, in the industry so that, you know, they'll come and give you a certain amount of money and ask you to work on their excipients or solvent systems or whatever, you know, just, just go do anything, you know, just publish papers, you know, for us to get some advertisement. And we can say that, oh, this guy, you know, you know, this guy is a reputed guy. He's using our material. That's a great advertisement for them. Okay. And then based on the novel skill set or equipment that you have, okay, so you have some, some kind of an equipment that the industry does not have. In such a case, you can you can attract funding. You have to take it and market it. Okay, so how would they know that you have something in your in your in your organization that they don't have it, right? So you should go to them. Okay, so these are the things you have to really work like. A, you should have a business plan to go go forward and and deal with all these things. And uh, while doing all these things, be very careful with the industry in terms of two things. One thing is they push, push you to do or push, push you to say, uh, not all the industries, I'm not talking for all the industries, but some industries, they'll push you to say something that they want you to say. Don't compromise, okay? So always have this transparency, just have this in mind that, you know, I will remain transparent no matter what, okay? Whether they give funding or not, fund, no funding, it is okay. But don't say simply just for the sake of advertising, okay? So this is very important, you know, I give you an example. Somebody was making a Garcinia Cambodia nail polish to, uh, you know, um, for fat burning, for reduce, uh, reducing the weight, okay? He wants, I'm, I'm probably the second or third scientist in the United States who's working on the nail diseases. So they would want to come to me and, uh, um, they would want me to, you know, go out and tell that, yeah, this Garcinia Cambodia nail lacquer works, you know, it, it, all the contents will, will pass through the nail. If I say that, they will have 10 times more market, okay? Don't simply, don't say just for, they're ready to share the profit, you know, that's that's not everything. You're fooling the people. Don't do such things in, when you're associating with industry. This is a bigger risk. You will be lured, you will be, um, you'll be asked to say something that they want you to say, even if you're not willing to say, Please stay away from all these things. Um, youngsters get attracted to such things. Please don't do that. And also be very careful. Get your payment before you submit the data. This is another thing. Okay, it's a big lesson that I've learned. Okay, always take the money and then give the data. You tell the project is completed. We have nice data. We can present everything to you. We can give you the report. But first the payment, the milestone payment should come in. Otherwise, you'll only send the data. One other way uh, that you can work, you know, any project will have multiple perspectives, right? So project importance, I've written as three project importance here. The project is important from the application standpoint. The project is important from the method standpoint. The project is important from the material standpoint. You'll have to see it that way, okay? You have to see it that way, okay? So we were developing some kind of a programmable uh, device to deliver anesthetic into the skin um, in, in children. Okay, so basically we wanted to non-invasively administer the general anesthesia in the operation theater. Okay, so our objective was to develop a electrically mediated programmable device. Okay, so um, we used uh, the, the main objective of the project was the device development and testing it in clinic and so many other things. But we used a, an anionic cyclodextrin as uh, one of the excipients in our formulation. That was a, one of the main ingredients actually it did a very big functional role in our drug delivery system, okay? So the anionic cyclodextrin um, company uh, has a patent on this anionic cyclodextrin. 
So I contacted the company and then I told them that, hey guys, you are, uh, are you aware that this anionic cyclotection can be used for this purpose also? They said no. And then I invited them to one of the presentations. Indeed, they were there uh, in, in one of the conferences that I went to in Turkey, even Dr. Professor Wavia was there. And then, you know, I met them and I asked them, why don't you attend my presentation? They came and attended my presentation. And it was all about the use of this anionic cyclodextrin in this uh, drug delivery system. Okay, so they got really fascinated by the idea See, you can, if you just call up and then talk to them to say, this is the application, uh, they may listen to it and they may forget about it. But if you make an attempt to uh, present to them, you know, so meet with them and explain what is the application, what could be the, um, you know, future market benefits for them out of this work, then they would, they would uh, be more than willing to um, fund you. Okay, so in 2011, I did this. Uh, in 2008 or nine, when I approached this company for funding, they only gave me material. They said, we don't, we cannot fund you guys. Okay, but in, in 2011, when I presented this data to them, they started funding my lab. They're still touchwood. They're still continuing to fund my lab. And it is now uh, not with any specific aim. It is just that, you know, every year some money comes into my, my uh, lab and we are free to do anything with their material. Okay, so we can try out multiple applications with their material. Okay, so that's, that's, that takes a long time for you to establish you know, a relationship with the industry and such things. Okay, so I would just want to uh, just uh, cover a couple of examples now, um, just to tell you like how much the speed with which you work in research matters, a pass matter, pace matters, okay, in research. Okay, so I, as I mentioned, you know, I work on nail diseases. This is a situation where, you know, you see that the person is affected with the nail fungus and he has all distorted nail and everything, right? So we started working on a novel technology. Uh, and then, you know, so we were, uh, while we were working, there was another university, I didn't just uh, purposely didn't put the name here. So another university, there was a PI who was working also at the same time. Okay, so but only difference was that we were able to generate more data uh, because we worked uh, day and night and then we could publish the paper two months before these people the, from the University of uh, whatever XYZ published. Okay, so it's the same kind of work. Indeed, they did uh, more work, but they just waited before they published the data, okay? But this was very helpful for us. There was a company in uh, Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts, Transport Pharmaceuticals, they were developing um, some, um, you know, a treatment for the nail fungus. They saw our publications in General Pharmaceutical Science. They came straight to us, they funded our lab for two years. It was a huge amount of money. We could support a postdoc and a couple of students and everything. Okay, so that's why, see, if you get an idea, don't simply sit with the idea, don't simply present a poster and forget about it, don't keep discussing with 10 people and then again, don't leave it aside and then think about it after two years, it's a loss to you. It's an idea that comes to, that came to you, it's an idea that you own, you should own, then you should continue working on it and publishing uh, as early as possible, um, you know, in case if it has to come back to you in the form of funding, it would, okay, so otherwise also just for uh, the sake of um, uh, owning that that concept that, that for just for the sake of saying that this is the concept that I develop you have to publish first you have the idea you keep the idea in your mind but somebody else works on it and publishes first you cannot claim it, claim the oneness on it so the another example do you believe in karma so many people say I believe in karma right um, so uh, let me give you this example. Okay, so how karma works in research. I worked on a technology called as magnetophoresis when I was a PhD student. Okay, so um, I mean this was just an additional work that I was doing that I was doing in, in MS Ramaya, um, and then I published a paper in Dye Pharmacy. And then I see that this you look at the year. Okay, this was like in 1999. Okay, and then I see that in 2002 somebody got a patent in the United States on the technology and he cited my work. He says, Murthy, MS Ramaya College of Pharmacy did such and such a work, okay? So you may be wondering how this paper is already published, how did he get the patent? See, this patent thing is nothing but, um, um, it's, it's a big game. Basically, all you need to get a patent is a good lawyer and a bunch of money, okay? So that, it's, it's okay, you can get patent even if there are 100 publications out there, okay? So all you need is a good, good lawyer. And then this guy got a patent on it. 
I was just sitting and looking at it. Oh, I did the work and I did publish a couple of papers, but it, this guy got a patent. I didn't know because at that point of time, we didn't know like how to write, a, how to, I mean, where to go to get a patent also was, was a big question for us. And then when I was working, I was, I was a postdoc here and I did some more work. We published in Journal of Control. It's one of my graduate students did uh, uh, some more work in my lab on magnetophoresis. We are just busy publishing. But the idea when I did, when I published my first paper from India, traveled to Australia, okay? And then this company, obj.com came up. You see the, uh, the uh, advertisement here, leader in magnetic enhanced delivery solutions. Okay, this company came up much later after the paper was published. And this guy started making some patches backed with magnetic field. Okay, and then he has some patents and everything. And then finally, uh, he outlicensed the technology to a multinational company in US. Okay, um, so I was sitting and watching, I was really feeling bad. Oh, this guy made a patch out of my technology. You know, what did I get? Okay, and finally, when, the, when, it, when it arrived in the multinational company, this company did not know how to evaluate this patch because they don't have any clue about the magnetic field. Okay, they were really looking for an expert. Okay, here comes Dr. Murthy. Okay, then they found me and they came to me and uh, funded my lab and we evaluated all the technology that they developed, but the, that the company developed and gave all the data to this. See, when I did the work, when I got the funding, so I see whatever you do, if you, if you do it without expectation, just out of passion, just out of sincerity, um, you would get the benefit at some point of time. Things would take time. You should have that patience. You should just do things without expectations. So uh, this is uh, one example uh, where you know, um, uh, an innovative work uh, went unrecognized initially, but eventually it came back to me in the form of funding. So this is all I have uh, for today. Um, I think you know, my advice to all of you the beginners is, you may be thinking, oh, I'm very little and there's a long path to go. Uh, you know. Uh, don't have such confusion. Start where you are with what you have. Okay, so this is very important. Okay, so um, I, I'm not talking to you like as an expert or anything. I may be just a couple of steps above where you are, but you know that's only because that's not because I'm smarter than you. That's only because I came before you. Okay, just keep that in mind, and anybody can get up the stairs if they try hard. I have a few more quotes that are very inspiring to me that I keep uh, looking at, okay? You have to come out of the shell, otherwise you will stay a nut, okay? You have to come out of your shell, your inhibition, your um, uh, complex and whatever is, is stopping you from doing research. Please do research for the sake of doing research, not just for the grant, okay? Grants are important for you to keep going, okay? Grants are important for peer recognition. Grants are important for you to pursue your, um, you know, the area uh, that you're interested in, okay, you're passionate about. Grants are important, but do research. Everybody should do research, okay? We need more and more researchers in, in, our, in our country, okay? And then um, I really like uh, uh, this, uh, you know, quote from Warren Buffett, um, you know, we, without passion, you don't have energy and without energy, you have nothing. There's no life, okay? Curiosity, why, why kids have so much energy? Just imagine why the five year, six year, eight year old kids have so much of energy because they're curious about everything. They're curious about everything that's going on around them, okay? So we have to be curious, we, sh we should continue to be curious. If that curiosity stops, you have no energy, you have no life, okay? So please keep your enthusiasm um, and uh, curiosity, you know, up always so that, you know, your passion builds up in research. And this is another Warren Buffett quote. He says, no matter how great the talent or efforts, some things just take time. Okay, just believe in this. Just some things, would, they would happen, but it would take some time. Actually, in, in this quote, he continues and says that uh, in a lighter sense, he says, you know, you cannot get a baby in one month if you have uh, nine pregnant women under the same roof. No, no way, right? So every baby requires nine months, okay? Just uh, have that in mind. And lastly, this is a very inspiring quote that I always keep looking at. If you do not do what you cannot do, that's not a problem, okay? But if you do not do what you can do, you're a tragedy, you're really a disaster, okay? So with this, um, I think I will uh, 
thank you um, once again for your uh, patience. I know I overshot my time by 15 minutes. I'm uh, very sorry about it, um, but I wanted to tell all these things. There are so many th other things to talk about. Maybe we'll have a second episode some other time. These are my uh, email addresses, murthygroup at gmail.com. Very easy to remember, murthygroup at gmail.com. Research IDB. This is our IDBR research uh, team's email, uh, researchidb at gmail.com. You can shoot an email. Um, mm -hmm. Let me know how you like the presentation. Or maybe if you have any questions, if I cannot answer today, uh, I would be more than happy to answer as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, Murti, I take over here now. Excellent presentation, I should say. And sure. there are many pics and references from Ramayana. Is it being telecasted there also in US? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> because during the COVID time, that was the attraction here, especially I during know. the lockdown. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you, Murthy, on behalf of APTI for your insight on research grants and sharing your personal experiences for the gain of young researchers. Absolutely. So it was my pleasure. Session. Thank you, Murthy. We now open the session for questions. Participants, kindly raise your hand and I will unmute you one by one or ask you to unmute yourself. Yes, Swati, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Welcome, Swati. Uh, thanks, Professor Muti, for giving such a wonderful presentation, uh, which will really help us uh, to uh, go forward in this area, actually, for application of more and more grants. I have a question, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible for uh, Indian researchers to apply for NIH-based RO grants either alone or in collaboration with the US-based researchers? Um, there are certain schemes, schemes that are meant for uh, international research, okay? So where you have to have a um, investigator from the United States okay. working with an investigator in India, okay? So maybe a, a few institutions, if I can remember, I think St. John's in Bangalore has some NIH grants um, probably uh, one of the pharmacy schools also, I can't remember the name, has an NIH grant where an investigator from the college is working with an investigator here in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. But that is uh, allowed only if uh, the Indian investigator offers something that is highly critical, like there's something that you can do only in India or some technology that does not exist in the United States. Okay, so there is always this question, right? The funding agency would ask, why do you want to go overseas? Why, why don't you collaborate with somebody here um, who has the same expertise, right? This is, this is a question that uh, the funding agency asks and the investigator in the United States need to justify that, okay? So he has to tell that, oh, none of the people here have this expertise or this is something, this is very specific to the tropical country or maybe something which is uh, specific to uh, some place in India that's why we want to go there and do the research. Something like that, you know. Okay, so it means, it means chances are very less to uh, uh, get these type of grants. Um, it, it depends on the on the thrust. It depends on the thrust area, basically. It depends on what you propose. Okay, people have been continuously getting the grants um, on certain areas because they have that kind of an expertise or the, that kind of a uh, patient pool that they work with. Um, the people have been continuously getting, you know, particularly the St. John's, I know that, you know, they've been getting a lot of grants from NIH. It's not very difficult. If you, if you can justify, it's possible. Okay. So, uh, uh, Indian researchers can uh, uh, only apply in collaboration with US-based researchers, not uh, standalone grants. No, I don't think any standalone grants are possible. Multiple PIs are possible. There is something okay. called as multiple PI grants where uh, you are not considered as a co-investigator. You are also considered as a principal investigator. You are the principal investigator on, on the <laughs> Indian side and uh, somebody else is the principal investigator on the uh, Western side. Okay, so that, that way it is possible. So it's a multi-PI multi, multi -PI grants. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Murti, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, do we have any more questions? You need to press on the hand button that will raise and then I can ask you the question and unmute you. Muthi, for your knowledge, we have Dr. Uh, Paranjyoti attending your session. Mm -hmm. And even Shobha was keen, I don't know, she may be stuck somewhere. She's busy, very busy these days. Okay. So, okay, I'll ask the participants to mail Murthy because he has shared his mail. 
Um, Manoj is here once again. Okay, fine, Murthy. They'll mail it to you. They need some time to adapt your presentation. It was so very informative. Okay. Uh, thank we you. thank you once again for your time and concern for fellow researchers. Uh, thank you, participants, for your involvement. Hope you all uh, benefited from the talk. Uh, I expect you to fill the feedback and send so that your e-certificate will be dispatched only basing on that. Thank you once again, Murthy. Have a great day. Thank you, Raman. Thank you, everybody. Bye.